Welcome. So um, I'm going to talk about, just give an introduction about this uh, plucky little instrument here that's uh, going to head towards the sun by talking a bit about the science. So I've got a, um, a question, and that is, uh, can you tell me about some of the most spectacular events that you see up in the sky? Um, can you list some that, that come to mind as being eclipse? That's, that's a good one. Um, so Aurora, exactly, that's two for two. Um, <laughs> so, so you might have heard about the total solar eclipse from last year. That was a you know, very a, a big deal. Um, and, you know, it was a big media hit, for instance, and I work in the media, so I, I pay close attention to this. It's a beautiful image of the eclipse. Um, so this, just to give you an idea of how popular the um, eclipse was, so this is, this is a map showing um, searches for solar eclipse from Google. And so the darker, darker parts are showing where there are more hits um, than average. And you can see, um, if you've seen it, d d learned anything about the eclipse, that's the path of the eclipse across the U.S., so that, that was an example of how people change their behavior because of this event, which is, uh, I think, pretty cool. So there were lots of different maps that were made um, to do with the eclipse. Um, and so someone said on Twitter that there are no more eclipse maps to be made, and then that became like a challenge. I mean, how, how can we make more eclipse maps? And so, um, so this one, if uh, the older people would know, Total Eclipse of the Heart is a, a song. Um, so, so the best place is with heart-like names to watch the, the solar eclipse. I didn't know that there are many heart-like names. So this, this one is to experience the eclipse in a place called Eclipse. Again, I wouldn't have guessed that there would be that many places named Eclipse. Um, and then this is my favorite one, which is the best spots to see the eclipse and Bigfoot at the same time. Um, <laughs> So again, <laughs> these are Bigfoot sightings. <laughs> so that was all fun, right? Um, but there was a lot of good science explained along the way from, from good scientists like Kelly Corrick. And uh, she was in the middle of the media coverage. I mean, this is a, an interview she did. It was live, wasn't it? Yeah, live on NBC. Um, and I think she did a terrific job. And I think, you know, there were lots of sort of things that... that were, you know, challenges, I think. One, look, look at the weather for a start. That was sort of depressing to see uh, cloudy weather on the day of the eclipse. And then um, she kept getting photobombed. I don't know if she could, <laughs> she could see this. <laughs> there's one kid there, then there's another, another girl there. And then in this one, she's photobombed by a different girl and by a boat. Um, you know, so <laughs> uh, and then, I mean, she had to duck off. She had, to, she had to duck off from that interview to an MSNBC interview that was going live. I mean, I would have had a stress headache um, from, from being so tightly scheduled. I mean, that would have been very difficult. So, um, you know, I've talked about photobombing, and this, you could argue that this is like the ultimate photobomb event, right? The moon moving across in front of the sun. Uh, so this is, so Tony, I don't think, did any uh, media interviews. Um, that's fine. Most of us didn't. Um, so he was in Oregon, he had beautiful weather there, he was with family. But one thing that I do wonder about, right, is that um, if you look closely at the map up in Oregon, <laughs> this is the Sunscotch one, there were quite a few, um, quite a few big sports sightings. He may have a more interesting talk than I thought he was going to give. Um, <laughs> so, so this is another, someone said Aurora, this is another spectacular um, event um, that we see when we look up at the sky and there's... there's many, many beautiful uh, images, photos, and, and videos online showing Aurora. Um, so, you know, a question is what, what do these two things have in common? What do these two images have in common with each other? Um, can anyone guess? Yeah. The sun. The sun, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, you know, the sun is the star of the show. That's a terrible pun. And then, and then here, here the, yeah, it's, it's, it's stuff blowing away from the sun. Um, that impacts, you know, interacts with the Earth and causes the aurora. The aurora. And the aurora have, I mean, uh, these outbursts, you can call them like temper tantrums, um, they, uh, you know, they cause problems for satellites. Um, you probably hear from Kelly about space weather. Um, instruments like Chandra that I work for have to basically shut down because um, they'll do damage. Um, so, so these are significant um, effects that happen. Uh, and then... You know, astronomers can also be annoyed. Even, even a quiet sun gets in the way of observations. Uh, so this is, you would have heard about the gravitational wave event um, a couple of months ago if you were here. Um, that was, you know, this was one of the biggest 
you know, most exciting events um, that's happened in astronomy in some years. I mean, to see this event in gravitational waves, to see it in all sorts of electromagnetic radiation. But it was only observable for a bit over two weeks before the sun got in the way. <laughs> and then, then it was unobservable for, um, for about three months. And see, this is just the Chandra observations. You know, immediately when, um, when the sun got out of the way, um, Chandra started observing it again. And this, all sorts of other telescopes would have a similar sort of map. Um, but this is, you know, this is sort of a bias for a lot of astronomers. I mean, the sun is our star. I mean, it, and, and, and what's special about it is that it has a direct effect on us. It, you know, it's crucial for life. And we can get up close to study it. And that's something that we can't do uh, with any other uh, star. And you'll be hearing tonight um, a lot about that, about getting close to the sun. Um, so uh, just to, to briefly introduce Kelly, um, she got, uh, if I remember this right, a BS and a master's and a PhD from University of Michigan. And she came here in 2006? 2002. 2002, okay. You're... Yeah, I was a pre doctor. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, you're the head instrument manager, science of operations for a suite of, uh, of instruments on the Parker Pro. Uh, that's right. And then um, I'll introduce Tony now, even though, um, so <laughs> even though I was speaking now. Are you going first? Yeah. Kelly. Kelly's, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so Tony uh, got a BS from University of Oregon, and then he got a PhD from uh, Boston University, so he's sort of a local. And he's the um, instrument scientist for uh, the solar probe cup on the, on the Parker Solar Probe that he'll be uh, talking about uh, tonight. So um, that's it from me. Oh, there's a picture of uh, Tony that I didn't show. Here he's being photobombed by his instrument, I mean, the, the, the uh, instrument on the, uh, on the, uh, on the probe. And, uh, and there's a, another picture. I mean, this is, you, know, you just look at this and you get the idea of how, how um, challenging this thing is. It's heading towards this, you know, ball of heat, um, <laughs> this giant, you know, a set of a fusion reactions going on. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think the, the, the media coverage of this will be uh, exceptional. I mean, just the, the naming of this instrument. Um, was, was fairly big news. Um, so I hand it over to Kelly. special site to finally, um, as a solar physicist, see the corona with my own eyes. I've spent so much time building telescopes and working on particle instruments um, and seeing it through these, um, through these different means to actually see it with your own eyes is so incredible. So if you haven't seen an eclipse, I highly recommend. There's another one coming through America in about six years. Um, make sure to ha make your plans and, and get to see one. So today we're going to talk about extreme spacecrafting. So uh, there, there's spacecrafting and there's extreme spacecrafting. This is very, very extreme, NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Um, we have a lot of first or ests uh, in our name. So we're gonna be the fastest uh, uh, man-made object ever, so 430,000 miles per hour. Um, we're gonna be the closest to the sun. So as, you, as Peter was saying, we're gonna get really close to this ball of sun, uh, this ball of heat. And so if you think of the Earth on one side and the sun on the other side of a football, an American football field, um, the, the, uh, the uh, Parker Solar Probe is going to the sun's four-yard line. Some of these loops that you see go out to the 15-yard line. So we will be within the reach of the sun. So just a little bit more about who I am. I am a rocket scientist as well as, a, as, well as an astrophysicist. So I spend my time doing many, many different things. Um, this was a rocket experiment that was launched in 2012, high C. Um, other people have now taken this telescope and will be launching it again this summer. Um, I also spend time doing public outreach, communicating science. Um, I was yesterday uh, at, in Congress uh, communicating that. And that's all a little bit due to the place where I work. I work for the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. has 19 museums and nine research centers. How many knew that there were research centers from the Smithsonian? 
Good. That's, that's better than average. <laughs> Most people, when you say the Smithsonian, they think of the ruby slippers, the Hope Diamond, maybe the baby pandas that you saw in Panda Cam. Um, but <laughs> the Smithsonian also does research. And so um, that's the telescope that was on that rocket picture previously. Um, so I am part of that proud, proud tradition of not only increasing uh, increasing knowledge as well as diffusing it. So the, the museum's diffused knowledge. Um, and Henry, my elephant, is, is my favorite museum on the mall in natural history. So getting back to the sun, our star. Um, so this is what you would see if just on a bright sunny day here. And again, don't ever look directly into the sun. You will hurt your eyes. The only safe time is for that brief moment when it is in total eclipse. Um, but this is what we've seen as, as, a, as a human race for, for just millennia, that this is all we've seen. It looks kind of boring, looks kind of, um, you know, kind of just a yellow ball. Um, and we really didn't understand how living with it affected us. It wasn't quite such a such a uh, nosy neighbor at the time. Um, <laughs> and it, it's become more nosy as we get more technologically advanced. Um, so this is a, a 16th century painting of astronomers watching a solar eclipse. And again, the only time that we got w glimpses of what's happening besides that yellow ball we saw um, is during these eclipses. Um, and Peter showed this picture, I think, as well, is during the eclipse, you see these elongated structures coming off, of, uh, coming off of the sun. And those were clues that something's going on, um, but we don't quite know what. And so again, looking at the yellow ball, a picture taken um, from above our atmosphere so it looks even crisper. Um, and you see it's, it's a pretty, again, kind of boring, a boring uh, star. This is why uh, other astronomers don't necessarily understand that this is the only star that really matters. Um, it, it, is, it really does, right? Um, that, um, that it looks kind of boring. It's middle-aged. Um, it's not very active compared to other things. So, so it's, it's, you know, it's not necessarily the, the most interesting thing. But you know, there is the, that little blemish there. And, and what, what really is that? Um, and so if you do a close-up, this is the sunspot. So this is a concentration of magnetic energy. Um, and that magnetic energy um, moves and it is linked to, uh, to the surface and, and underneath the surface of this hot ball. And so this hot ball is around 5,000 degrees. And that's important because um, as we look at this next picture, we look above those sunspots. And this is, it, it's, it is from a different day, but each of those sunspots are associated with one of these bright regions. Um, so that magnetic activity, as you can start to see, if anybody played with iron filings when they were a child um, and you use a magnet, you see rings or loops that come up. That, come up. that is those loops right there. Um, and so that's that magnetic field guiding the plasma, and plasma's hot gas um, that's, that's fully ionized. So it's, it's different than what we're used to exp experiencing in everyday life. Um, an old light bulb would be one of, one of the plasma experience in our everyday life. Um, and so this, uh, the sun guides it. The sun um, also throws these temper tantrums that I think I can get it to play again. It plays very slowly. But I think you saw over here, um, it starts to be active and throws off the uh, coronal mass ejections. So billions of tons of material hurling at us at millions of miles an hour. Um, so these are images taken by the uh, Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Those four telescopes were built here in Cambridge um, by the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And um, these take a picture every 10 seconds in 10 different wavelengths. And when I say wavelengths in these pictures, you can think temperatures. So we're looking at different temperatures of the, um, of the sun and what it's doing in all of those. Those 10, picture, 10, uh, 10 w temperatures every 10 seconds is the, every day is the equivalent of downloading half a million iTunes songs a day. So this is a huge, a huge issue in terms of how do you download it, how do you store it, where, where are all those songs going, what, you know, what genre are you listening to, um, all, all of these different things. So this is, this is one of the uh, telescopes that we have been involved with here. So I was, again, showing you uh, the, te the temper tantrums, or those the coronal mass ejections. And the other analogy that I like to use for the coronal mass ejections is that the weight is equivalent to approximately 80 million school buses being thrown at us at a million miles an hour. So these are massive, massive events, huge events. Um, and what we do here to get this image is that dark blue circle with the white circle inside of it. The white circle inside of it represents the sun. The blue circle, the blue disk, 
is blocking out the, the disk because as you saw, it was very bright. And so they block out the disk and we're able then to see the puffs that come out on those that billions of tons of material. Um, but we also see a very steady wind. And so that's another weird thing that the sun kind of does is throw off this wind. Um, and so that's another thing that we're, we're looking for. So we're going to the sun, July 31st. I hope that she goes off then the first day and that, it, and Parker is a she, by the way. Um, <laughs> spacecraft is a she. Um, it's named after a man, but it's a she. And um, she is going to leave the Earth. And there's multiple reasons why we're sending her to the sun. Um, and one of which is that we're explorers. We, as a, as a, as a, as humanity in general, we want to explore. We want to see what's out there. Um, there's also the practical matter of living with this star. And again, the neighbor kind of throws stuff out on our lawn. And so we have to figure out how to deal with that. <laughs> um, so we want the practical matters of living, of living with the star. And that doesn't just go for us here, but that also has impact in if we were ever to live on Mars. If we want to go to travel to Jupiter, um, if we're going to go to another star, we also need to know that because we need the weather report for the trip. Um, as well as scientific curiosity, there are just some very basic math and physics problems that can be answered by looking at the plasma experiment that's just set up for us right over here um, in the solar neighborhood. So just for emphasis, again, this is one of those ejections starting, and there's the approximate size of the Earth. So we are not that close, so, <laughs> so luckily we're not, you know, that we're not that close to neighbors, um, but we're, we're relatively close, and so that's, that's a lot to deal with. It, the sun has a big impact and has a wide impact on the entire solar system. So again, we're explorers, and Parker Solar Probe has been 60 years in the making. So in 1958, the uh, Space Sciences Board put out a Simpson Committee report. And in that report, it founded NASA and said there should be a NASA. There should be a, an agency that takes care of all of these things in space. Um, it also made a recommendation um, that you should visit every body in the solar system. And so we have all the bodies in the solar system here. I left on Pluto, even though he's, like, it's not a planet anymore. I, I still left him in there when I was a child, he's a planet. Um, and we've visited Mercury. We visited Venus. We live on Earth, so I think we visited um, <laughs> Mars. <laughs> we visited Mars. Um, we visited Jupiter. Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, we're still not at the sun. Um, so this is really 60 years in the making. And part of it has just been that we haven't had the technology yet um, until the last 10 years to really protect us from that heat that, and all of the energetic particles that are, uh, that are coming off of the sun in those eruptions. Um, we just didn't have the, the way to do that. Um, and now, and we also didn't have a mission design. To be fair, we had, we now have a mission design that can actually accommodate all of those things and not just be a one and done. Some of the earlier Parker solar, or solar probes uh, were to go into the sun and to basically be, uh, and just burn up. And, you know, when you spend a lot of money on a satellite and a lot of time, you prefer it to have, you know, 24 chances at measuring something instead of just one. Uh, so it's, it's a culmination of all those years of work that it actually, um, that that's actually why we uh, why we can go now. So next, we're turning to um, living with the star. So who today has used their GPS? <laughs> okay, all right. So we know cell phones. Who today has watched a television? <laughs> so these are all our our life is based on technology and electricity um, and these satellites that are in Earth are that are around Earth. And the problem is, is that the sun, living with the sun, it produces space weather. So the sun influences everything um, in the solar system and basically keeps us in a protective magnetic bubble from the rest of the galaxy. Um, but at the same time, it, all of its wind and all those chromatic ejections affect everything. Um, so starting with the sun on top, we start looking at it throwing off all of the energetic particles. And those are things that can damage spacecraft electronics. Um, so like Chandra has to shut down. Um, when we um, when we have these energetic electrons uh, coming towards us or, or protons from solar flares, um, we have issues with our GPS signals. So you can't communicate well because when the sun throws off these things, it messes with the atmosphere and causes bubbles and kinks and things don't go straight and they don't go in the right direction. So you can't necessarily rely on GPS. 
Um, and so that's that's a big issue when you want to say land a plane. There's you know runways where you you'd like them to land. Um, I was just on a plane last night. I'm very glad it, it, there was no solar solar storms. Um, the uh, and there's radiation effects on on um, planes. Uh, there's also the ability to induce uh, currents in the power system. And so basically you're overloading the power system and you overload the power system. And if you don't know how to control it, you can control it if you know it's coming. But if you don't know it's coming and you don't um, power down or power up certain systems, you actually will um, you'll actually overload transformers and burn them up. And some of the transformers can't be replaced for six months. So imagine Boston without lights for six months. That's not something that we actually really want to talk about um, or think about what happens when those things happen. So because of all these effects, we really need to understand those predictions because we also don't want to turn off the power when we don't have to. Because, you know, if, if once a week, we, you know, solar physicists are like, hey, let's shut off, you know, all the power and, and Fenway isn't lit, um, we're not going to be very popular people, um, you know, very soon. So, so we really need to understand our star. So the drivers of space weather are these three things. So we start at the sun, and that's where the solar flares happen. Uh, the solar flares are big, huge explosions. Um, they are that magnetic field reorganizing very violently. Um, they produce, one of those produces enough power to power the U.S. power grid for 400,000 years. So this is just a huge amount of power um, that's being released um, and energy. And then well, associated with those are coronal mass ejections. So again, those those uh, billions of tons of material, at millions of miles an hour, uh, coming right coming towards us and towards other planets um, in the solar system. And then these energetic particles are the fastest, and they actually come come from the solar flares as well as the front of that coronal mass ejection, which is actually some of my uh, work that I focus on is that shock front in front of it accelerates some of these solar energetic particles, um, and they come into Earth, causing those beautiful auroras, but again, could also have the negative side effects. So that's that's the second reason we're going. The third is scientific curiosity. The sun is still mysterious. We've lived with it for a long time, but it's still mysterious. And, and it does at least two weird things um, that we're still trying to quite figure out. So this is a campfire. And I think most of us have had an experience with a campfire or, or a fireplace. Um, and what happens when you walk away from it? You normally get colder, right? Well, so the sun's um, campfire is this nuclear fusion in the core. And so that's around 15 million degrees. You go out to the surface, it's around 5 million or 505,000, and then you go out, then you go out to its atmosphere, though that puffy part um, that we were seeing in the, in the magnetic fields, that is a million degrees plus. So we've walked away from the campfire and we've gotten warmer. So that seems very odd. So that's something that we really want to understand in terms of what's, what's going on there. And there are two main theories here. Um, as to what's going on, um, one of which is the fact that the magnetic field is rooted in the in the surface, and so these funnel-like things are basically uh, representing magnetic fields, and these are motions that are taking those those bottom anchors and kind of moving them around. And this um, this observation over here shows that there's some things that kind of stick up from the um, from the sun, and when you move them they think there was waves generated. Um, and those waves being generated um, cause other energy to move and could possibly then transfer that, uh, transfer that down and heat up this to cause that extra heating um, that's available there. So that's one method. Um, then there's another method that has to do with, again, the rooted, uh, the rooted foot points, the right, rooted magnetic field in the surface being moved around. And when they meet and they're actually um, oppositely aligned, they do that violent reorganization. And that violent reorganization done on many different scales is then thought to do, thought to basically reorganize and throw off all of this heating, like shown in these observations. So again, if you watch the loops right here, it kind of changes shape and gets brighter. And this is one of the, this is just, again, one thing happening on the sun. The sun's much larger than this. It happens multiple times. It could be a mixture of those two to, to actually get to the heating. So this is another image. The sun is off to the, off to this side. And uh, we're watching that flow. And we're also watching a comet come through. And, and it should repeat, so we should be able to see the comet. And I want you to notice what's happening as the comet comes closer. The tail is always directed away from the sun. That was one of the first clues that the sun 
had this weird wind that was always coming off of it. So it was constantly losing mass, constantly blowing a wind. And how does that actually happen? Um, so these are images that we take by, again, blocking out the sun, but looking, um, the dots behind it are a star field. So you're looking at the stars behind it, but you're also looking at this constant flow um, out from the sun. So there's all these interesting things, and there's a whole bunch of people interested in actually studying this. And this is just a small portion of people associated with Parker Solar Probe, all of these large missions. Um, there are thousands of people in all the states and different countries um, that work on different aspects from finance to, um, to engineering to science to data management, project management, all of these different people work there. And this is actually Eugene Parker, um, who is the spacecraft is named for. He's the first person um, ever to have the spacecraft named after him while he was still living. Um, and so he actually got the chance to meet his own spacecraft um, in October at this meeting. And Tony is actually in the building back there, actually testing <laughs> when this picture was, was being taken. Um, so you also see uh, Martian Bauer, who's also another seminal figure in when Jean wrote the first original paper about the wind. Um, she did some observations that, that, uh, that proved them. So. So this is, uh, we're going to launch on July 31st. If I keep saying it, it will happen. <laughs> um, we've got a 20-day launch window, so it's first day, though. Um, so we're going to launch. We're going to go into the sun, and our first closest approach is going to be 35 solar radii, um, so very close to the sun. Um, and then we're going to successive, successful or we're going to successively uh, meet Venus, and she's going to take a little energy. We're going to give a little energy to Venus, and she's going to kick us in closer and closer to the sun until we're eventually at uh, 8.5 solar radii from the surface of the sun. And so that's that uh, being on the sun's four yard line and being very close, uh, close to the sun and very warm. So what we're going to do there and what our objectives are is to trace the flow of energy that heats and accelerates that cr the hot corona as well as the solar wind. Um, we want to determine the structure um, and dynamics of the plasma, so watching all these magnetic fields and how they change as they propagate to the Earth, um, and explore the mechanisms that accelerate all those energetic particles. So we need a certain payload to do that. Um, and first, we're going to need a thermometer, right? Because we, we kept talking about um, needing to take the temperature. So we're going to need a thermometer. We're going to need an anemometer to tell us the wind direction and wind speed. Um, we're going to need a, uh, an a magnetic field, uh, field meter to tell us about these magnetic fields and which way they're going around. And we need a camera because we're good voyagers and we always want to take pictures and send them back when we, uh, when we go on, on trips. So this is actually what we've, what we come up with in terms of the instruments. And, um, and so we first have the thermal protection shield, which is really important because we're at a very hot, a hot place. Um, it's going to block most of the sun from these instruments. Um, and then the rest of the instruments hide behind that, um, except our cup, which Tony will talk more about. Um, there's, there's solar, solar, uh, arrays on either side to power the spacecraft. Um, there's a cooling system that's actually cooling water, just water cooled. There's a high gain antenna. That's our phone home device. Um, and one of the problems we have is that the sun actually also is a very good radio source, so we have to compete with radio stations. Um, so we have to wait sometimes till we're further away from the sun in our orbit to actually talk back to Earth because the sun is just too loud and broadcasting too much radio um, frequency. Um, and then we have the another part of our sweep suite um, is the span um, the span. Uh, B, which is, uh, measures electrons. And if you flip the spacecraft over, you can see the field's antennas, which will measure the magnetic field, will be that magnetic flux, flux uh, meter. Uh, we have Whisper, which is our camera taker, our picture taker. Um, and we have ESIS, which is the energetic particle detectors. Um, and then we have a magnetic field boom, and we have an ion detector as well on the other side. So this is me in the spacecraft uh, with, with my friend Keith. We were trying to decide where to go to lunch. We'd been up for 12 hours already, and it was only 11, and so we were looking for lunch. Um, and uh, this is the magnetic swing test. So this is a very interesting test. Um, when you do these spacecraft, you have to test them before, before they go anywhere, and we want to measure those very precise magnetic fields. So you see it's actually hanging by a crane. Um, it was just being put down so we could go to lunch, and um, it, it was picked up. And basically, you pulled it back and you let it swing. And these magnetometers here measure the magnetic field intrinsic to the spacecraft. So we can subtract those off of our measurements so that we know exactly what the magnetic field is. Um, so that was it last July uh, that we were doing that testing. 
So now this is again that uh, another day of those images of, of things coming off of the sun. The sun is about two solar radii and then going out. And so where we're going to park this spacecraft is right about here. So as you see, there's just all of this stuff coming by us. And we're going to have to understand all of this. Um, and we're going to have to measure it. And we're going to have to measure it well. And there's so many challenges in, uh, in doing that. And so I'm going to let Tony Case now take over and talk to you a little bit about measuring, measuring that space. Thank you, Kelly. Very good job. Uh, so Kelly gave you a great justification for why we want to build something like this. Now I'm going to take over and I'm going to tell you what exactly we ended up building. Uh, and it was a great challenge. Uh, so there's some really in interesting things that I think uh, I think it'll be fun to to show you. So I'm the instrument instrument scientist for the Solar Probe Cup. Uh, so that involves a few different things. One is a picture like this. So I get to go inside the clean room that Kelly was just showing you and hang out with the spacecraft and eventually put the instrument on there and all those sorts of things. And that's super fun. That's probably like 0.01 percent of my job. Uh, most of the time, I'm in front of a computer. Uh, in this case, it's an, it, probably 10% of my job, and it's another fun part, and I'm sitting outside of a vacuum chamber. We've got a vacuum chamber here, and we've got computers that we're running the instrument inside of, of the chamber, and so we're actually testing the instrument and seeing how it works. So that's fun. Uh, but probably 90% of my job is sitting in front of uh, Microsoft Word documents or PowerPoint slides or something like that. In particular, I show this document, and this is a requirements document. So one of my jobs is to interface with the engineers. So the engineers sit down, they actually draw on paper and, uh, well, they use computers now, but they draw out what the instrument's going to look like. Then they put the instrument together. They're doing all this work, but they're not the scientists that know what the instrument needs to do. Uh, and so my job is to get on paper exactly what the instrument needs to do so that the engineers can build it. So again, going back to these science objectives that Kelly was showing you. So this is the sort of top level of what Parker Solar Probe needs to do. And there's various ways that we're going to make measurements to address these objectives. As Kelly showed you, there's magnetometers, there's cameras. Um, but the, part of the instruments I'm going to talk about are particle instruments. So for really for all of these objectives, we have to make measurements of the particles. The solar wind that's flowing out from the sun is made up of a bunch of particles. As Kelly was showing you, that the corona that she was showing you is essentially light scattering off of particles. And we can see how many particles there are. Um, so we really want to go there and make measurements of these particles. So how do we do that? Well, making particle measurements in space is a lot like making particle me measurements on the Earth. Uh, on the Earth, we measure air. So these are gas molecules, so they're neutral. So this is um, just sort of normal molecules. And if we go into space, then we still have these particles, but they've been broken apart or what we call ionized. And so we've taken a neutral particle, and we've broken it up into an electron and a positively charged particle. And we need to make measurements of both of those while we're in space to really understand what's going on. But what we actually want to measure is essentially the same thing on Earth as on space. Uh, if you want to make a weather measurement, a weather station, then you measure the speed and direction of the wind. You measure the barometric pressure and the temperature. And these are essentially what we're going to measure with these particle instruments in space. So we want to measure the speed and direction, which is what we call velocity. Or the density of particles, the number of particles that we have in a given volume, and the temperature. Uh, the difference is that because this is a plasma, because these particles are ionized, we also have these electric and magnetic fields that can be sustained in the plasma so that we also have to measure those. Uh, so this is essentially the measurement that we're trying to make here. Um, so we want to measure the number of particles as a function of their speed or energy. And when I say something has a high energy, you can think of that as essentially having a high speed. So we're trying to trace out this curve so we can learn about uh, what the distribution of particles in space is. And when we make those measurements, then we can derive the parameters that we're used to talking about, like velocity uh, or the density, the number of particles that we measured, or how hot the, that plasma is. But we really do that by tracing out this curve uh, and counting the number of particles at each speed. So the solar wind plasma is really coming from everywhere because it's really hot. And because the spacecraft is moving so fast, you can sort of turn in any direction, and you can see plasma coming towards you. And the bulk of it is coming from the sun, but to really understand everything, you have to look in all directions to see uh, what particles are in, in what location. And the way we've done that is we've put together four different instruments. 
scattered about the spacecraft that all look in different directions. And then we take data from each of these instruments, we sort of stitch them together afterwards, after we get the data down to the ground, um, and then we can build up this picture of what the whole sky looks like. So uh, starting from the top here, we have the solar probe cup. That's what Kelly talked about. That's what we built here at the Smithsonian. Um, and then our friends out of the University of California, Berkeley, built these three instruments called the solar probe analyzers. Uh, and so uh, these four instruments together make up what we call the suite of instruments called sweeps, solar wind, electrons, alphas, and protons. Uh, Part of coming up with an instrument for NASA is coming up with good acronyms to go along with it, <laughs> which, I think we, which I think we've done here. Um, so, the solar probe, so the solar probe cup uh, looks directly at the sun, and it measures ions and electrons. And then we have the solar probe analyzer B, which is sort of on the behind side of the spacecraft. So as the spacecraft's going around the sun, the, spa the uh, span B is looking out back away from where the, the spacecraft is going. And on the front side of the spacecraft, or the ahead side of the spacecraft, we have uh, two instruments that are measuring the ions and electrons. And so they're sort of looking at the plasma that we're about to fly through with the spacecraft. Uh, so the instrument I'm going to talk about the rest of this talk is uh, the solar probe cup, which is a Faraday cup type instrument. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit more about how it works. Um, but this picture, I really just wanted to show you how we've designed, in general, this instrument so that part of it sticks out on a strut on this little arm and it's actually, my arm's a pretty good representation of the size of it. So there's a strut that comes out, and then there's a cup on the end of it that's really making measurements. And that way we can get the, the interesting measurement part of the instrument out in the sunlight, which is where we're trying to look, is toward the sun to make measurements of particles coming from the sun. But then we can have these electronics sitting back under the thermal shield that Kelly told you about, so that it's sitting in shadow and in a relatively cool temperature. So this is what we built. This is the solar probe cup for Parker Solar Probe. Uh, and so, as I said, it really consists of two main components. The electronics module on the left here, which stays pretty cool. And then the sensor, which is over here, the silver and black. Uh, and that part is the part that gets hot. Um, so you can really see that they, and just from the looks of it, you can tell that they're designed very differently because of the environment that they're going to be in. One is going to be cool, one is going to be hot. And we designed them out of different materials and uh, uh, different coatings so that they behave the way we want them to. Uh, and so I'm going to spend the rest of this talk detailing sort of some of the design challenges that go along with building an instrument like this that will get up to extremely high temperatures. So for scale, this is the instrument. This is me. Uh, and so uh, this is in the lab just out by Alewife. So there's, the Smithsonian has a few buildings scattered around Cambridge. Uh, and out at Alewife, we built this instrument and put it together and did a lot of the testing. Um, so in some of these pictures, I just want to point out, uh, you'll see some of this bright red stuff. Um, these are what we call red tag items or remove before flight items. So those don't actually fly with the instrument. We actually go uh, near launch. We go in and, uh, in fact, some of the time, even when we're encapsulated in the fairing on top of the rocket, we'll open up a little door reach in and like take off one of these red tag items. So they don't fly, they're just there for protection uh, while it's on the ground uh, for sensitive surfaces. So I'm going to do my best here to explain how a Faraday cup works in about 60 seconds. Uh, and I mean, it's a fairly complex uh, measurement device, but I think, I think I can do this, so bear with me. And feel free to ask any questions if you, if you don't quite understand what's going on. Um, because I want, to, I want you to understand how this thing works when I tell you about all the design challenges of why it was so hard to make it. Um, so I switched now from a picture to a, a computer model of the instrument. So this is what I was telling you about with those engineers drawing on a computer. So they draw each individual piece, um, and on a computer they see how it's going to fit all together, and then they actually go and machine them and put, it, and put it together in real life. But using this model, I can show you a cutaway. So now we've taken a cross section through the middle of the instrument so you can sort of see the insides of how this thing's working. Uh, so again, this is the strut here that's sort of holding the instrument out from behind the heat shield. And then this is really the measurement portion of the instrument up top. So the way it works is we take a high voltage. So whereas if you go to the wall outlet, you get like 120 volts, we're using 6,000 volts here. And so we send this, this high voltage signal up this cable uh, to the measurement portion of the instrument. And there's a, a transparent grid. It's about 90% transparent in there so that 
particles can go through, but we can actually still take this uh, grid up to a certain voltage. And by doing that, we can create an electric field. So these green arrows here represent an electric field. And because we're trying to measure charged particles, that electric field can sort of act like a filter. So if a particle, like this blue one here, has a low energy, it comes in and it sees this electric field, and it gets repelled and gets rejected back out of the instrument. But if a particle has a high enough energy, then it makes it through the electric field and is able to get down to the sensing portion of our instrument, where we measure them. We essentially count the number of particles that make it through. And then that signal goes down into our electronics, where we amplify it and digitize it and then send the data back to Earth. Uh, and so then, in order to build up that, that plot that I showed you of trying to count the number of particles as a function of their speed, we basically scan through a range of voltages. By, and so we change this electric field, and we can select which speed of particles are making it through the instrument. And so we work our way through the different speeds, and we count the number of particles at each speed, and there's our data, and we send it back to Earth. Did I do it? 60 seconds. That's a Faraday count. Uh, okay, so Faraday cups, as I just described them, are really nothing new. Uh, we've been building Faraday cups. I say we, I was not building a Faraday cup in 1961. But these cups, uh, the heritage for this type of instrument goes to back to MIT, um, and they were building them in 1961. And that has been passed along to the cup that I'm showing you today. Uh, and in 1961, Explorer 10 launched, um, and Gene Parker, who the spacecraft is named for, was the first person to predict the solar wind. Uh, Explorer 10 was the first instrument to go up and actually measure the solar wind in 1961, just a few years later. Um, and so there was a Faraday Cup on, on that. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft, you may have heard of them, uh, also had Faraday Cups on them. Uh, actually, this is four Faraday Cups, sort of all stacked together in an interesting configuration, also built at MIT. Uh, so these instruments on the Voyager spacecraft went out to a grand tour of all of the outer planets, out to the edges of the solar system, in fact, beyond the edge of the solar system at this point. And then, as we know, they were, of course, uh, found by an alien race, turned into a sentient <laughs> spacecraft, <laughs> and then Captain Kirk found them. Um, so this is from Star Trek The Motion Picture, and I just find it interesting because you can actually see the Faraday Cup on Voyager spacecraft. <laughs> so here are a couple more recent Faraday Cups. Uh, WIND and the Deep Space Climate Observatory, or DISCOVER spacecraft. These are actually still in operation, well, as is one of the Voyagers. Um, these are in operation still at the first Lagrange point, we call it, which is where the gravity between the sun and Earth balances. So it's only 1% of the way to the sun. Um, so it's really close to Earth, but they sort of act as a beacon, like a weather beacon or a buoy upstream of Earth, so we can measure the solar wind just before it gets to Earth, and we can have just a little bit of time to react to exactly what's about to impact us. So Faraday cups aren't really anything new, but the environment that we're going to is. Uh, so the sun, when we get to our close approach, is going to be 475 times brighter than it is if you walked outside uh, this afternoon and looked up. Parts of our instrument are going to get up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is hotter than red hot. The instrument itself, while we're making measurements, will be glowing uh, a red-white color. So this is quite a challenge to actually build something that's going to be able to make measurements uh, and just be able to tolerate the environment. So many of the standard sort of things that we use and the practices that we use in building spaceflight instruments just don't work. So, for example, coaxial cables. Uh, just like the cable behind your TV that you plug in, your cable TV, um, that sort of cable is basically what we use on regular spacecraft. Uh, and it would probably tolerate up to about 55 Celsius or 100 Fahrenheit. Um, and it would instantly melt if we put it on this spacecraft. So we have to come up with something new. Similarly, aluminum, standard spaceflight metal, that's like just generally what we use, can't use it on this spacecraft. Epoxies and glues, we can't use those. Thermal control, you have to design your instrument to be the right temperature. That's completely different in this. Uh, electrical insulators, as I'll show you, uh, typically you use certain materials to keep one voltage from another voltage, and you just can't use that. And then another thing that maybe a lot of people wouldn't think about is test facilities. So every instrument that we build for spaceflight, we have to test. And NASA's motto is test as you fly, fly as you test. 
So you need to come up with some sort of a scenario to put your instrument and have it be in vacuum, be the right temperature, be measuring the right things, all at the right time, so that you can demonstrate that you're not just going to waste a bunch of money when you put this thing up in space. So I'll show you uh, some of the challenges we had with that. I have to admit, we are flying a heater to the sun. So it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but we have a big radiator to get rid of a bunch of heat, and we have a heater on the side to heat us up. So as Kelly showed you, uh, we're not just going and parking at the sun at, uh, at close approach, right? We're going into this orbit where we launch from Earth, we go in, we get close to the sun, we come back out to Venus, and we do a Venus flyby, and then we go back in, and we make measurements, and we slowly inch our way in. But every time we come back out to the far reaches of our orbit, we're back out between Venus and Earth, and we get cold. Uh, so we really have to account for both of these situations, and we do that through a pretty complex thermal control system that we have on the instrument. Um, and so one of those things is the radiator panel I showed you. So when we get super close to the sun, things get hot, and we radiate a bunch of heat out this radiator panel to space. Space is very cold, so that's an efficient way to get rid of a bunch of your heat. But then we go back out to Venus, we get cold, and we turn on our heater. So these two things are battling, and we have to really very carefully design the instrument. In fact, if you look closely, the instrument wasn't originally designed with this big of a radiator. The box only comes to here, and then these wings are built on, uh, because at the last minute we were like, uh, we're going to be too hot. <laughs> and so we made the cover bigger uh, so that we can radiate a bunch of heat out. And that's actually kind of standard. A lot of times you do that, and then you end up having to put tape on because your radiator is too big. So it's really, really delicate. Another thing we do is we use materials that have a really low thermal conductivity. So heat does not flow through them very well. Titanium is one of those materials. So we build this strut here that goes between the hot part and the cold part, and it's sort of a long strut made out of uh, titanium. And so the heat really doesn't want to go through this piece of metal, and so we're able to sort of control where the heat is keep it on the hot side so that the sensitive electronics are the right temperature. We can also coat things. So this is titanium here, and this is titanium. One's gold, one's black, and that's because they radiate heat differently depending on what color uh, you coat them. Uh, and then the other thing is sort of just like the spacecraft itself, where we take thermal shields, we put it on the front of the instrument in, uh, in a couple places, and that reflects the heat, uh, and then it also absorbs and is able to re-radiate the heat. And so we're able to put something on the front of the instrument that gets hot instead of the instrument itself. So, as I said, we can't use aluminum. Uh, so we have to use a whole host of materials, uh, some of which are exotic, in order to uh, build an instrument that can tolerate the environment that we're going to be in. So, uh, so this is now a view from the front of the instrument, um, and I can sort of walk you through the different materials we've used the majority of the instrument is built of these materials, tungsten, molybdenum, which is hard to say, so we call it moly, uh, niobium, titanium, and sapphire. Uh, so I'm, I'll point out the sapphire. People are usually interested in that. It's, it's actually become a fairly usual material these days because if you have an Apple Watch or an iPhone, uh, it's likely that your screen is actually made of sapphire. So this is lab-grown sapphire. You don't go out and you know, mine this and find gems. This is actually, it's not even really crystal clear. It's uh, kind of a hazy material. So you can just see in here uh, the sapphire that we've used. So as I was saying, inside the instrument we have uh, a grid, a transparent grid that sits at 6,000 volts. So that's this ring here. The ring below it and the ring above it sit at zero volts. And if you don't insulate those two materials, then you're going to have little lightning arcs kind of going off between these things, which would ruin the instrument. Um, and so we isolate it with these little tiny pieces of sapphire, these little pins uh, that separate these two things. And then the rest of the materials we sort of choose based on how hot the location is uh, in that particular part of the instrument. So at the front of the instrument, this heat shield is made out of niobium. The grids are made of tungsten. Um, back in here, everything's made of moly. Down here, we actually get cool enough to use what most people would call a high-temperature material, but this is titanium. Uh, and then we get back to the electronics box where the temperature is relatively low, and we can then again use the typical aluminum that is usually used. Another thing that we cannot use is epoxy or glue. So typically in a spacecraft, uh, you have these screws. You put in a screw, and then you want the screw to not fall out when you launch. And there, it's an intense vibration environment when you launch. Screws and everything else tends to rattle loose. So what you usually do is you take a little bit of epoxy, and you put it on the screw, and it stays put. But we can't do that. So we have a, a very steady-handed technician uh, so we're well zoomed in here, right? These screws are tiny. 
Uh, if you drop them, trust me, I've tried this, you cannot find them on the ground. Uh, so, so what we've done is we put little tiny holes in these little tiny screws, and then we take a little tiny wire and we run it through those holes and we twist it up and we run it to the next screw and the next screw, and this is called safety wiring. Actually, next time you're going on, onto a plane, if you look at the, some of the bolts around the doors as you're getting on, you'll see they're safety wired. They have some of the same, same problems. Uh, and so he has to go through and put in each tiny little screw, in each little piece of this instrument, safety wire around every little one, and that wire keeps the screws from falling out. Coaxial cable, like I was saying, we, can't, we cannot use, so we had to build our own. So this is a coaxial cable. It does exactly the same thing that the cable going into your TV does, but it does it at 6,000 volts, and it does it at a couple thousand degrees. Uh, so a wire comes out of the instrument here, and you sort of, like a bead necklace or something, you have to string each little piece of this, uh, this tubing onto a wire and then put the screws in, then put the next piece of tubing on, screw it in. And so every little piece is done like that. We've got four coming out of the back of the instrument here, taking our signals back to the electronics, high voltage coming up here, uh, and every one of those has to be put together by hand with, uh, you know, with tiny little pieces of hardware. Uh, and so we made these... We made these cables out of niobium, and then inside of each of these cables is a little tube of sapphire that gets grown uh, as a crystal into this little tube, and we can slide a wire through that and, and, and make a cable out of it. Another thing uh, that we have to do is basically build our own test facilities. So, uh, so this is what we call the solar environment simulator. So in order to test our instrument, we have to reproduce all those things I was saying. Uh, a vacuum, so we have a vacuum chamber, we have a big window on it. We've got an ion gun, an electron gun to shoot particles so we can make measurements. Uh, and then outside of that chamber we have four modified IMAX film projectors. So we got these, some of these we got off eBay, uh, and they're actually surprisingly cheap. Um, so, and then we modified them to take what usually you have is like an IMAX screen, right? Huge, like bigger than this wall. We take all of the light from that IMAX screen and we shrink it down to the size of our instrument, which is about this big. And then we take four of those. And so when we do that, we can get the temperatures in the instrument up to nearly the flight temperatures. We can't quite get up to the actual temperatures we'll see in flight. And that was one of the problems is we, as hard as we tried, could not really design a test facility that allowed us to really test as we fly. So we did testing here, and then we also went down uh, to another laboratory, and we did some testing down there that is different than this, got us up to the right temperatures, but was lacking in other ways. And so we, were, we really had to do this balance of, like, not everything was quite right, but we're still confident it's going to work once we get up there. Uh, so after we build it and we test the instrument itself, then we, uh, um, we stick it in a case, and these are some of the engineers who actually worked on the instrument, so I thought I'd show them. Um, and ship it off down to uh, the DC area where it gets put on the spacecraft. Um, so now you can see the solar probe cup on top of the spacecraft, peeking around the heat shield that's up here. Um, and this is actually an acoustic testing. Uh, so one of the tests that we do is we put huge speakers in a room and then we blast it with sound waves because rockets are loud. So we test it. Um, and so I just, I, I think this is a, a great picture of the spacecraft because you don't often get to see it without any red tag items on there, any remove before flight stuff. So this is really as it launches. Um, and as it launches, you can see we put these thermal blankets. It's covered in basically like aluminum foil. Um, and so all the models you see, you see like these instruments sticking off and like uh, it, it looks sort of, uh, you know, like you think a spacecraft should. But when it launches, it actually looks like this, just a big mass of gray. Um, this is, you know, without the blankets on, so you can see it like how it actually looks now. Um, and this is how it currently is. So this is down at Astrotech, which is just outside Kennedy Space Center. Um, so this is the current state of the spacecraft. Uh, it's still missing a few things, like its thermal shield, uh, which should be up here, its solar panels, which would be around here, and it doesn't have any fuel in it. Um, all of these things are the sort of things that we add on late to a spacecraft because they're very sensitive, uh, and we don't want to damage them, so they get shipped separately and then added on at the end. Uh, and you can see now a bunch of these red tag items that are all going to be removed before we launch. Uh, so coming up July 31st, we're going to launch. We're launching on a Delta IV Heavy, um, the biggest rocket available. And it's funny, if, if you look at a picture of uh, the, the nose cone of this thing, it's huge. This rocket is meant to, to launch like bus-sized Department of Defense spy satellites. Uh, and Parker Solar Probe is not large. 
right? This is like the size of a human, uh, just, just slightly bigger. Uh, and, you know, most of it's empty space. So it doesn't weigh very much and it's not very big. But we're launching on this huge rocket because we have to use a ton of energy to get down toward the sun. Um, so I encourage you to follow us, follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Um, I mean, I'm sure there will be other news coverage and everything also. But, uh, but this mission is really exciting. Kelly showed a picture of all of the scientists that have actually worked on the spacecraft. Um, there's a whole host of other scientists that haven't had anything to do with the spacecraft but are eagerly awaiting all of the data that we're going to get back from this. The last time that we went even remotely close to the sun was in the 70s and early 80s with the Helios spacecraft. They only got to 0.3 AU, 70% uh, of the way to the sun. We're going 95% of the way to the sun. People right now still go back and look at those Helios data. That's like the best data we have. So this is like a once in a generation sort of mission where we're going to get data that people are going to be going back and looking at for generations. Uh, I, I think of this mission uh, in terms of magnitude as right on par with like the Mars landers and rovers, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, as far as heliophysicists are concerned, this mission will provide the data that they've really been looking forward to and are really going to finally allow us to understand how this entire system, the solar system, uh, that we exist in with all of this plasma, really figure out how this eventually works. Uh, so follow along July 31st on NASA's first mission to our nearest star. Thank you. All right, that's very good. So we're open for questions now. Yes, please. please. So on our instrument, all our thermal shields are niobium. And interestingly for me, uh, the niobium is, is actually an, an alloy. So if you take a metal, then you add in different metals, you get different properties. Uh, and so this is an alloy called C103 that is really made to be not only temperature resistant, but also very strong. Um, and so it can withstand all of the environment that we have like when we launch. Um, the heat shield on the spacecraft is an entirely different material. It's a carbon, like a carbon foam kind of. Uh, and so it's this like really fluffy and it's this thick. Ours are like sheet metal. The, the thermal protection system on the spacecraft is like this thick and it's a foam. If you rub it, you actually get like black dust off and it's made of carbon. Uh, and then they face uh, the, the two sides of it with like a carbon fiber, so like a sort of a hard thing. And then they paint the top of it white. Um, so it's actually two like really different ways uh, to shield the to shield in the spacecraft or our instrument, but both of them essentially do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. How do you derive the energy for that device, and is it short time? And like, how do you get you know to capacitors to get the six thousand volts? Yeah, I mean, essentially. Um, so it is it's actually operating on an alternating current. Uh, so it's, and the reason we do that is that there are lots of uh, there are lots of various sources of noise in space. So you build an instrument and you might have uh, high energy radiation, so like galactic cosmic rays or solar particles or something. They come flying through your instrument. Um, they're super high energy. Um, so that would cause noise. Uh, there's, as you might imagine, a heck of a lot of UV light coming from the sun directly into our instrument, which also would cause a lot of noise. But all of those noise sources are really steady. So like direct current, right? It's just like those, that noise it might change over hours or something, but it's not changing over short time scales. So what we do with our high voltage is we take 6,000 volts, we put on top of that a waveform that's oscillating 1,000 times a second, and then we look at our signal, and, but only the part of it that's oscillating 1,000 times a second. And so if you look at the two things in concert, you can basically throw out all of those other sources of noise that are constant. Uh, and so it's really an AC waveform. And it's all driven by the, the solar panels, right? The solar panels, plenty of solar energy uh, at this distance. Um, and so, uh, so we have a battery that then drives us. It's like 22 volts, just kind of a normal, you know, it doesn't even shock you if you touch it. It goes into our instrument, then we have an amplifier that takes it up to 6,000. 6,000 volts at 1,000 hertz. Yep. Oh, you. Um, So you predicted all of the sun's weather, right? 
Is there anything that would be unpredictable that might um, mess up the mission? Oh, definitely. <laughs> we and and uh, you know we we've, we've thought about a lot of the things that could happen, and we have some uh, some you know years and years of, of experience in observing other things remotely. But when you get there, there's always the unexpected. Um, it's like taking a trip on Earth. There's always you know a plane delay or or something that you just didn't quite expect um, when you get there. So there's a the very good possibility that. Um, that hot corona will be different than we thought it was, that it's more dense, less dense, um, hotter, and we hope so, colder. Right? And we hope so, actually, because <laughs> that's going to be the interesting thing. I mean, that's one of the things with operations is we want to keep it steady the first one because I think we're going to get something weird back and we're going to want to figure out is it the instrument that's not behaving properly or did we get find a weird cool thing that we now need to study 24 times? You know, like what, what, what is that? Um, so we're actually hoping for the weird stuff. <laughs> and a lot of people have predicted what weird things we're going to see, right? Like, we don't know. How long is this mission supposed to take? Seven, uh, seven years is the, is the nominal, nominal time. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, what's the temperature on the front of the Faraday cup versus the temperature behind it where the instruments are? So the very front of it is around 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then once you get back in shadow, it's like, 55, it's like a uh, room temperature, basically. Um, it's amazing how fast you can go. Uh, you know, if you, though the corona is a million degrees, it's very tenuous. It doesn't actually transfer that heat to anything. So you're sitting in this environment that's really hot, but unless you're directly exposed to the sun, then you can easily radi radiate your heat to space. So it's one of our biggest dichotomies is that the fact that when we're at closest approach, we actually need our heaters. Uh, because when you block out that, that, the only source of heat near the sun is the sun. So when you're blocking out the sun, the back end of the spacecraft is actually cold to need heating to actually get up to the room temperature type. <laughs> it's very weird, very weird mission. At the end of the mission, uh, what happens to the probe? Uh, so, well, at the end of the nominal mission, what we hope happens to the probe is we get an extended Emission. mission. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But eventually, so the way the, the spacecraft points is we have momentum wheels. So think of it as like a gyroscope or, you know, if you're holding a bicycle tire and it's spinning and you turn it, then you move. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> that was Thank a really you. good question. <laughs> I think we have to evacuate. <laughs>